Hello, it's your Geordie Journals. <laughs> Hope you can hear our loud and clear. We've obviously got the new mics again. You're probably going to hear the roads, you're going to hear the birds, you're probably going to hear everything, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. But you want a better sound, so we thought we'd give it to you. But hopefully you can hear us loud and clear for a bit of midweek talk about all things Newcastle United. Yeah. I've got my little notepad here. I've listed down your questions. A bit old school, that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Is it I could, in shorthand? It, it's not in shorthand, <laughs> no. Um, I can no longer read my shorthand. Anybody who doesn't know who shorthand is, there might be some people out there who don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, it's true. Well, it's kind of a journalistic... Uh, Way to write as quickly as you can. Yes, it is, yeah. And it's to a, die or not, I'd say. Very much so, very much so. And if you, That's how people manage to get things down in court. Anyway, we've gone off topic. We've gone, <laughs> we've gone really boring for everybody gone, out there. Uh, Juno Juno as well. It is, pra Juno. it is, I'm eh? a busman's holiday here at St James's <laughs> Park. But as you can see behind us, St James's Park in all its splendour. Hopefully one day nicely expanded and revamped. A lot of talk of that at the moment. Yeah. Maybe address that before we come on. I've got, I've got like I said, this notepad here. <laughs> here he is. We didn't know if Jordan Cronin was going to turn up, by the way. We right? actually said start without so us. We're not being sham. So, so this is quite <laughs> interesting. Now he's going to join. The Geordie when Journals. We actually haven't said anything. Yes, he doesn't not know yet. what he we've said. <laughs> God, we've been on half an hour, Jordan. Come on. <laughs> anyway, I'll let you know. So I've got my notepad here. I've got a few questions that you guys have fired out of us from the last videos. Keep them coming. If you do ever want the Geordie Journals to answer any of your questions, any topic, that's Jordan Cronin tooting again. We're live, you know. We're live. He's apologising. <laughs> Right. Chaos ensues as ever on your Geordie Journal's latest episode. Got your questions, we'll answer them. If you've ever got any questions, do fire them our way. Put them in the comments on our YouTube videos and we'll always look to address them. In comes Jordan Cronin, the late comer. This isn't Sorry. good enough, this. Sorry, mate. You'll have to apologise to the uh, apologise to the viewers out there. Sorry, Sorry guys. But now, it. as you can see by the timing, we've literally just stopped. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> We probably could have started this again, but what's the point in starting again? We'll all just jump in. Right. We were literally going to address, um, because this video will go out after embargoes, etc. We were going to address the, uh, the interview that you're going to conduct in a bit, which is with Peter Silverstone. Yeah. And uh, in relation to uh, the expansion of the club shop, etc. Maybe yeah. give, give everyone out there a little bit of detail on that. Yeah, so the... Uh, the I'm trying to think what the, the actual term, but anyway, there's a temporary club shop being laid in between the Strawberry Pub and St. James' Park Metro slash St. James' Park stack. That'll be there from May 29th, I think it opens, until the summer, whilst the current store will be refurbished, extensively refurbished by um, Newcastle, obviously in line with the, the kit deal with Adidas. So, an exciting development because I think that club store has looked the same for a long, long time. I think the big thing with this is that commercially that Newcastle will now have control over their uh, merchandise will be in-house, whereas previously like Ashley Sports Direct, Cast Audios, etc. Newcastle didn't get the full advantage or the full money from um, kit sales, etc. Merchandise. So a big, uh, yeah, a big summer ahead for the club. Hopefully it'll help supercharge any transfer business, etc. Which I'm sure will come on to, but just a really positive step, I think. It is massive, Dom. I mean, it is like what Jordan said. It's it's been a, an area of the club that's it, it's been really neglected, hasn't it? And it was sort of taken advantage of to an extent by the previous ownership. Yeah, massively so. And you you speaking to the likes of Darren Eels, Peter Silverstone, that there is that need or want and frustration that they haven't had that until yeah. this coming season and the deal Newcastle are getting with Adidas not that we know the ins and out of it, outs of it but it puts them it certainly bridges the gap between them and the likes of Manchester United Arsenal like Liverpool to a degree the, these teams who have these mega kit deals and Newcastle are going to get a, a top package from Adidas by the sounds of it and one that will roll back the years for all the right reasons because I think if we Think back to all our favourite Newcastle kits. Certainly in the Premier League era, Adidas are not too far away. So I'm maybe he's a, in and around a decade, you guys senior. So I can kind of remember the uh, the real uh, mid '90s Adidas feel, and, and it was very much here at St James's Park. It very much felt like more 
than just a kit. It felt very much more than just a football club and just a team. It was like a movement. It was something to be a part of. The, the, the city was absolutely captured in a wave of just black and white joy. Um, obviously, the team did well. There was the, the epitome of positivity as a manager in Kevin Keegan who allowed us to dream and allowed us to believe. And it's just nice to have rekindled that. And I think Mirag Gadusi said something about it, didn't he? So it was, but it's something about two two old lovers rekindling yeah. and, and it very much does feel like that, that there isn't there isn't just a bit of poetic license from, from me or dad there. It is genuine it is a genuine thing and I'm sure everybody knowing the demographic of all you guys out there who do watch the Geordie Journals on a regular basis, I'm pretty sure you know that feeling too. And I think I hope the club are ready, whether this temporary or for the full uh, the full um, uh, kit launch, whether the, the shop will be open, etc. I hope they're ready for queues around the stadium because that's the way it was back then. And I know a lot of people who've been saving their, their pennies in the run-up to this, not just for the first, second and third kits, and we've discussed that previously. You've all seen them. There was the... the, the uh, what do you call them? Images, leaked, uh, leaked images, leaked kit images. They're as good as you're going to get. They are, they are true to life as what uh, we understand them to be here at the Geordie Journals. And I think you can definitely take my money with the uh, the third one with a retro badge. I am absolutely all for it. And obviously, of course, the uh, the second kit, um, iconic in so many ways. I mean, Castor was it? Puma had a flirt at it. A little flirt yeah, at, the, they did, the, yeah. at the kit a few years ago, and that went down a storm. So God only knows what the Adidas one's going to sell like. I, I think interestingly different colour shorts. I think that's the big change. I remember having the strange material they were, the cream shorts in the mid '90s. They were very unfootball kit like material, but these ones I'm sure will be up to scratch <laughs> and nice and blue as well. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's a real, it's a massive one for the football club, massive one for the area, massive one for the people. Um, and yeah, fingers crossed, Peter Silvenson. Ask him how much. Be interesting whether he gives that commercial information. Well, yeah. Try I mean, and find out how much for the people out there. Try and find out, you know, whether the club is ready for for what what's about to hit them this summer in regards uh, that commercial and how much it means to the club commercially. And yeah. Be interesting. Know his thoughts on a few other things as well. Well, if, if Castle were in charge. And they had these type of sales, Castor couldn't deal deal with it because they they, <laughs> they malfunctioned quite early in the Cast United. Uh, the process. C would be the right way around on the retro yeah, wagon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's another thing as well as Castor just haven't been able to deal with the demands of a big club like Newcastle United and, and the uh, merchandise that Newcastle fans want to buy. There's been loads of problems where that be shipping from the club shop, uh, shipping from you know online kit problems where you know the the uh, number. I know this wasn't a cast off problem, but the, the way the the sponsor was, where it looked like the number four on the front, yeah. etc. And then you had barges that were different to others. There was there was chaos with it. Have you not had like Emmy Martinez playing for Aston Villa with kit with barges upside down on his <laughs> on his playing? <laughs> Sounds kit. right. It's honestly there's some of the stuff that's been going around with regards to other clubs as well. They just you know thanks thanks but see you later. Well, we'll Adidas, we'll take it from here. But, I mean, at least, least you know Adidas are getting quality gear. You and do. Of course, there's, there's that. I mean, we all buy where Adidas. I was going to point I mean, Adidas. I usually have Adidas on. I've got a Fred Perry on the day. Adidas is always what I wear, whether it be trainers. Uh, it's the one you. time you're, you're it's the one time partners. we always like. So the Jordy Journals, it's like a Jordy Journals kit, isn't it? Yeah. Jordan turns up in his gazelles. Um, <laughs> I've got Dom's gazelles got his, on. Dom's got his sambas on, and I've normally got some kind of normally we specials. And and I've turned up in a pair of Nike today. Shocking. I know. I don't know what Blasphemy. I was thinking. It really is on a day like today as well. <laughs> But anyway, what's happening at the club today, you guys will see it if you're out and about in your castle this week. The actual containers are going down at St. James's Park for that temporary uh, setup until I think the, the big the, the big store gets kitted yeah. out in a fashion that Adidas would be befitting of. Yeah. One answer I'd want to get from Peter Silverstone potentially, because obviously the Castor logos on the Gallagher stand will be taken down. Ah. And then you turn your head and you look at that Newcastle United lettering it's more one maybe oh for, this is a you thing yes, this is so this, he always this mentions this in St me James's right because we look at it from the press box Newcastle United it's been there for years but not in its current guise the current typeface the current lettering is sports direct lettering as I'm sure a lot of people know and I feel like that needs to change that needs to go back and I think if they're going up there to take the Castor logos down change the lettering as well that's Why my my uh, 
some are requests from Newcastle. Jordan, you've got one question. One question <laughs> only. What's your question? <laughs> well, the lettering on the East Star needs changed. <laughs> this one's from. Uh, this one. <laughs> we've had someone put one in. This one's from Dominic Skew. Sadly, can't be here today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So that would have been. That would. I would have genuinely asked that if I was an Omni deal. But yeah. I'll bear that. He's on a day off. That's why he's not doing it today. But. Even on a day's off, we've always got time for the Geordie Journals. Always got time for you guys out there. So if you've liked so far what we do, we're going to delve into the questions that you guys have been sending us uh, on our videos so kindly this week. Do give this a like, give it a share if you love what we do. And of course, click the bell if you uh, love what we do and want notifications to whatever device that you watch us on. So do give this video a like. I'm sure there's plenty of you guys watching out there. And we'll continue, right? So I'm going to dive into the questions. Ooh, very posh if you know. We don't know them again. It's this, yeah, yeah, nobody <laughs> knows these questions. I keep them secret. It's typically unscripted. It is. And, 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 uh, it's old school again. I've, gone, is, yeah, I've gone, gone to the, the notepad. That may as well be shorthand, that way. It is. Oh, oh <laughs> mate. The amount, <laughs> my writing is disgusting. I, I don't think you can even read I, this. I, I can't read this. <laughs> right, so I've, what I've done is I've, I've just done it. It they could be in any old order. These guys don't know what the questions are going to be. But thanks for sending them in. I'll start with at Stee Wallen. After Saturday's switch in formation, has Eddie Howe brought 442 back from the dead? Of course, the context of that was for large parts of the game that we saw at the weekend, uh, Callum Wilson and Alexander Isak kind of formed a bit of a front two. George, has he brought it back from the dead? In a very unconventional way, I suppose. I, I mean, it's there an old school formation, there was, there isn't it? They were sort of rotating, yeah. weren't they? Where like, sometimes Wilson would drop in, etc. So I suppose he could say it was a front two, but for me, it always felt like Isaac was the typical what you call it now a number ten. Yeah. But I mean, it's one way of playing them together. Isaac has played that role, or I don't think it's his best role. Um, it did feel like so. I'll be honest. I thought when I seen the team, I thought it's a four-two-three-one. But at times it was. But actually, at times when Newcastle sat in, it was quite a conventional with with Murphy on the right and Gordon on the left, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a very different role for Jacob Murphy, wasn't it? Where yes. he did play quite a bit deep, even though it's probably his best game in black and white in a, really in a, a long time. He was excellent. I think he played two assists and played a role in one of the other goals as well. So yeah, um, in a lot of ways it, it worked. So Eddie Howe does have a, a track record almost, as if he, if he gets a good win, he may try it again. We saw it against Spurs and then the next game, against Palace it didn't quite work so big game against Brighton this weekend will he will he stick with 4-4-2 I'd be surprised I think he'd probably revert back to the 4-3-3 but we'll wait and see I think Burnley it was very much lent itself well to playing a 4-4-2 playing Callum Wilson his first start in two months and then obviously Isak in in great form at the moment couldn't drop him out the team so it was a good way to ease them in and, and Get them back playing together because I think it's the first time they've played together in a starting lineup all season since probably about this time last year as well. So it was certainly successful. He certainly brought it back in a good way. But whether it's here to stay, I'd be surprised. I think that's probably the next question I was going to push to you guys was was do you think he'll continue with that kind of style and formation? But I'll give you my thoughts on it initially. I thought it worked with a T. I thought. Eddie Howe deserves a lot of credit for the way that he set his team up. We're starting to see tactical nuances, I think, in the last uh, six to eight weeks that, that really seemed to elude the manager, and we were one of the first to comment on that. It was almost, we pick what we pick, we play 4-3-3, three, three, no matter what the player. Um, there isn't a horses for courses approach. There isn't any um, movement from that rigid formation that was played it isn't rigid by nature but rigid in selection in terms of it's 4-3-3 three, three, and this is how we play we'll continue playing I've been really uh, pleased to see those tactical nuances because I don't believe you can be a top level manager in this game and not have those things up your sleeve not be able to react not be able to implement different plans for different teams and different problems I think you have to have that the days of uh, for example a very basic Sir Alex Ferguson type thing who won titles galore and one of the most successful uh, managers around. I, I watched uh, Monday Night Football, anybody else who watched out there, and Ashley Young was on there talking about his time under Sir Alex Ferguson, I don't know if you guys watched it, and he, he just said there was no tactical work, they did no tactical work during the week, it was just we play the way we play, go out and win, go out and express yourself. You can't be a manager in English football like that anymore, Steve Bruce was very much like that, and we've seen what happened. The days of those those kind of managers are gone. 
So my concern, my biggest concern, and it was only a minor concern, but was mentioned on these videos, was that we weren't seeing that tactical nuance from Eddie Howe, and I do believe we are seeing it. It won't always work. I was critical, and I think these guys were too, of just do it again, just go and play, just go and do it again against Crystal Palace, and it didn't work. I, I would, again, I would maybe be concerned if he decided that was the way to go against Brighton, who we've seen pose a whole different set of problems to, to teams. They're not the Brighton of the start of the season that Newcastle United got trounced by, effectively, down there on the south coast, but they're still a big challenge. They still play direct balls into the forwards. They still uh, are very brave with the ball in their own thirds and draw you on and want those gaps to appear through the middle, which has kind of been what Newcastle have been susceptible to this season. They've got to make sure that doesn't happen. Kind of brings on that question, does he stick with it? Do we want to address these online rumours that have been going around about Callum Wilson in some way? I suppose we have to, in, in talking of the idea of, of whether he pick it again, we have to kind of talk about that. There have been People have been starting rumours. We see these fires starting all over from in the nose at the moment, don't we? It's, it, it, it's almost, they get the odd bit right, but there's so many wrong stories that it's hard to pick. It must be really hard for Newcastle fans without that radar and without that knowledge to really pick through the rubbish because there is a lot of rubbish from in the nose who, who just start a fire here and there. Callum Wilson could be injured, but that's the suggestion people are saying online. But there's equal, to equal amount to say that he might not be. We, I don't have any information on Callum Wilson. Do you guys have any information? So you're not hearing it from official, from us. We'll just presume, going into this next question, that Callum Wilson will be available because the players only went back to training around about now, midweek after having, he yeah. gave them a few days yeah, off, yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. he? Um, we've seen, I think uh, Bruno Guimaraes and Joe Linton went down to London with our other halves and spent time there. Miggy Almiron with his partner has been out and about. So I think he did give the players a few days off. So it'll only be now when we're really realising what our players should be filming this outside the training ground, really. <laughs> Seeing if Callum yeah, Wilson. So we should be spotting to see if yeah. Wilson goes in. Yeah. And he can walk when he gets out the car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, does he stick with it? If, if he's fit, does he stick with it? Does he change? Jordan? I think if you base it from. Uh, Tottenham at Crystal Palace, he found a formation that worked and stuck with it. If you want to base off again, he might, he might well stick with it on Saturday as well. I think three games left to, to go. Eddie Howe's got a lot of love for Callum Wilson, doesn't hide his love for Callum Wilson. I'm pretty sure Eddie Howe might want to do his bit to try and get Callum Wilson in the England squad. So, look, I'm I'm not suggesting that he has got total favouritism, yeah, but he does like he does like <laughs> Callum Wilson. He loves Callum Wilson. He said he'd do he's been good for him. He's been good for him, you he know has. what I mean? Like if somebody's been good to you for years upon years, there's obviously gonna be that little bit of feeling and loyalty, isn't there? Yeah. I would imagine. I think it's actually only human but, nature. Yeah. Eddie Howe's also experienced the full brunt of Callum Wilson's Very much. injuries yeah, as yeah. well. So it's probably works both ways. He'll know how to manage Callum Wilson better than anyone. He'll know whether he's fit enough to play three games, stop full 90 minutes in a row, things like that. So we'll wait and see. Well, it is one of the questions on the end of this. So again, we'll have to bear in mind, is he fit, is he not? We've got no information to suggest he isn't fit. So we'll, we will go with that one. That Before going to the next question, which has kindly been sent in by one of you guys out there, give this video a like if you enjoy what we're doing. We do love all of your support and we'll come on to the rest of the questions. But I want to kind of take this on a little tangent initially. Um, Nick Poe. Discuss. Nick Pope, discuss. Well, we know your feelings. Joe, should I say my feelings yeah, first? Yeah, you, you say your feelings So first, I think yeah. it's absolute lunacy that if he's if he's even fit enough to be on the bench, he should be in the team. We don't know the medical, we don't know exactly what's going on medically with him and his fitness levels, but I think he is he's head and shoulders above Martin Dubravka. If he wasn't head and shoulders above Martin Dubravka, he wouldn't have played so, so many games ahead of Martin Dubravka. We know that he's a better goalkeeper. Um, and for me, he's got to go straight back in the team. I would have had him in last week, never mind this week. I think Eddie Howe sort of suggested that Nick Pope would have to work his way back into the team. And I think naming him on the bench was his way of just sorting that out and going right now next week, Nick Pope. Is in the team. Thank that's, you, that's John. It's, a, it, it's quite windy. It's a dodgy. So apologies if you are catching that. I did tell you that the mic picks everything up. The uh, yeah, up. it's happened. The I last think. time this happened was a, was a midweek video. Oh, on yeah, the, uh, I remember watching <laughs> it. The groin and was it the groin and stuff? Yeah, I think only Eddie Howell know how well, how fit Nick Pope is training. How how good is he looking? It's been five months since he last played a game. He's throwing him into a massive game against. Brighton this weekend where Newcastle really 
feel serious about pushing that top six, even top five, they need to win. And yeah, do you throw Nick Pope in? I think Nick Pope's experienced enough to, if he has been training for the past couple of weeks or so, as, as Eddie Howe says, then he should be able to come in and do a job. And if the Euros are in the back of his mind as well, which I'm sure they are, then he needs to be playing games and proving his fitness and I think a home game against Brighton where he named on the bench last week he is Newcastle's first choice goalkeeper if he's fit he probably should come straight back into the team Yeah I would put him straight back in I think uh, Martin De has done okay I don't think we should sit here and wax lyricals of how fantastic Martin De Bravka has been because I don't think that's necessarily been the case I think he's, I think he's done alright It's been up and down hasn't he? Yeah but for me, Nick Pope is the best goalkeeper Newcastle have got and is the best goalkeeper Newcastle have had for, for many, many years. And let's be honest, they've, they've got a European race on the line, so this isn't just the end of the season. Let a peter out and go away on your holidays. They've got three games to try and get top six. And to get that, you need to play your best players. And Nick Pope is Newcastle's best goalkeeper. So for me, it's absolutely no brainer that Nick Pope comes back in. Will Eddie Howe do that? I think as a manager, he's always tried to stick by winning teams I think so maybe you will be tempted to stay with Martin Dubravka but as I say there's a lot on the line for Newcastle and Nick Pope's the best goalkeeper so as I said yeah, yeah I think he has to go straight back in for me Resounding verdict from the Geordie Journals Nick Pope in right I'm going to dive back in the questions do give the video a like if you're enjoying what we're doing this one next one comes from Graham Towler you'll still probably not be able to read this Graham Towler 1761 the at come on lads lads and lasses the at are crackers I've got a couple of users and all sorts in here, but they'll do the job. Right, <laughs> at Graham Towler, 1761. Thanks for your, your uh, question, Graham. Thanks for Steve Wallen for the previous one as well. This question from Graham Towler. Is it a problem attracting the best players to Newcastle United due to the geography of the football club? It's a lazy question. Not, no offence Not to, to, Graham, to no. Graham, but that, I so think that's a lazy narrative. argument, to a give, lazy narrative. To give the context for in Graham's favour, he, he, he described in the question that I haven't written down here, but I can remember what he said. He said he described it as a lady journalist he heard saying something like that in a press conference. It was asked to Eddie Howe. Was it? Was it? Week. Yes. So that's the question that he's referring to. Right. Eddie Howe, again, disagreed. Um, I think historically maybe Newcastle there is that London pull and maybe a Manchester pull these days which Newcastle doesn't have quite so much it is a quite well it's a one club city if you live here if you're one of the players you walk out and about in the street you will get spotted I mean I'll walk around Gosforth I see Callum Wilson yeah um Martin Dubravka, people like that. There's a particular oh, coffee shop in Gosford, yes, isn't there? Um, if you go in at yeah. any given time Honestly. on a Friday, you will literally see the full squad. Plus yeah, Eddie Howe, I've seen twice Yeah, I've there, seen Eddie so, Howe as well. Um, we'll not mention it, just so they're not swamped. But I'll try and get some sponsorship. For, yes. From them. <laughs> if you watch this and you're involved at that cafe, if you want to be a sponsor of the Geordie Journals, do shout up. But yeah, it's, it's very much, you are a celebrity, you are a hero around the city, whereas if you are in London, you might have more of a, a sheltered lifestyle, if you like, you can blend in a bit better so there is possibly that but in the same way some players may like that they might li like being being heroes and being icons in the city and, and there's something nice to be said about that but yeah I don't think Newcastle lacks any pull because of its location if anything it can be it can use it as a as a real positive where there's no Premier League club for what 100 or so miles and that's a, a positive thing the North is really, it's, like a, it's, it's, it's not a positive thing, it's a positive thing for Newcastle. Yeah, the thing about, you think about the balance of the Premier League at the moment, the North is, there's a real lack of Northern representation. Well, Burnley are closest so, away game and they're probably going down. So obviously the rest of the North East have traditionally had clubs in and around the top flight, Sunderland in particular, Middlesbrough, uh, Leeds United, uh, the, the Sheffield clubs, if, if you want to go down there, Sheffield Wednesday have had their struggles over the years. There's a lot of, you know, Bradford have had a team. Um, then you go across, like you say, you've got your Blackburns, you've got your your, your Burnleys. There's there's lots of football clubs who we're going to have been up in in, in time. Yeah. There are so many have dropped away that it's it's becoming a very south orientated and driven. We find it because we we travel to them all. <laughs> it's mm. it's a south driven uh, division. Jordan, does Newcastle struggle geographically? Attracting players? Well, I mean, I, I hate that narrative but I, 
I do. You think would because you bleed black and white. Well, I, I we do, all do. <laughs> but I do think that there's probably a case where a player may prefer London, and I'm not agreeing with Gabby Abonlo here, by the way, before anyone jumps us and says, well, I'd rather go on Brent. I'd rather go to Brentford for less money than company Newcastle. That was total nonsense. I'd rather he went there as well. <laughs> He wasn't very good, was he? <laughs> I remember, I remember that. last all-time Premier League score. That's embarrassing. That really is embarrassing. <laughs> I don't know how to use an example of a player, didn't he? Where he was like, I'd rather go to Newcastle on... I'd rather go to London on 30 grand a week. And yeah, let's go to Newcastle, Newcastle on 50 or which 40. Which causes absolute outrage, and rightly so, because it's total nonsense. But, I, I, I mean, if you've got... You know, if you've got a, a Chelsea and Arsenal over Newcastle, you probably go there because they're bigger clubs. You want to win things? Yeah. Ultimately, mm. everybody wants to win things. And I think my, my thought on the idea of, of geography is if Newcastle start winning things, it'll be no problem exactly. to get players here. If you offer more money than anybody else, it's also not, not much of a problem. You're always going to have certain people for the likes of their family and their lifestyle yeah. will want to move to somewhere like London. And Manchester is building itself. Never mind Birmingham, like Manchester is now probably the number two city in, in terms of like infrastructure size uh, availability to get around the world if you want to jet off somewhere and um, as we found out yeah we, we've flown there it's a rubbish airport by the way but we've flown from there loads of times um recently just for the european trips but yeah it, until newcastle start winning things or are available to offer more money than anybody else then i think players will always gravitate towards clubs that win things and i yeah. think the geography kind of goes out the window look not to be uh, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say Newcastle has any less benefits than somewhere like Liverpool, but Liverpool win things. So, and they're a traditional club uh, who always won things. It's an easier sell to go to Liverpool than it ever will be to come to Newcastle United, and that'll take some turning around. Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally, totally agree with you. I think that's probably the the difference. But there's examples of coming up here and being a hero, and that's your type of personality. And Newcastle is that absolute ideal place because no other football club or no other place in the country or in the country in the world will worship you more than Newcastle United fans and Bruno's found that out Bruno I think is the type of character that embraces all that I would say and Alexander Isaac is probably a type of character who was a lot more quiet at, but I think probably relishes the, the city and is not you know enjoy it for what it is always takes his dog on a walk around <laughs> uh, with gospel I think it is or you know elsewhere Paddy Freeman I think yeah. you've, you've got to come up here to, to experience it I think There'll be, there'll be a few players I'd say that didn't enjoy living up here but I guarantee there'll be the majority of players who play for Newcastle will speak highly about the city and you know the, the people and everything else that comes with there's examples of it all over the place I mean just look over the over the time to Gateshead and you see like someone like Rob Elliott who's a manager at um, at Gateshead who really embraced the culture he used to get the Metro into training I think he got a, I think he got a fine once didn't he, Did he? I think he got yeah, a fine for yeah, the yeah, Metro whether well, that was alleged or true I'm not sure <laughs> but uh, people like that who who came up here have no connection with here but then fall in love with the place there's, there's numerous examples over the years of people who've become Geordies by just coming up here and seeing what the lifestyle can give you it's a different place it's a different place altogether Nobby and some Solano's people love it back up here. he is yeah Jordan. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah best to look at Nobby Solano Bly Spartans of course yeah that, legend that, one of my he's a player who's come from South America Can't miles away. away and always trying to come back Ollie Bernard? Yeah, he's another one. Another one who just came and never left. Jordy Axon, isn't he? <laughs> he has, actually. <laughs> right, so yeah, I think we're all in agreement that yes, it, it potentially could cause problems to certain individuals, it's but like, if you're up for the challenge, Newcastle will love you for it. Just that question, Graham. Give it a like, everybody who's enjoying the Q&A that we're doing here midweek. St James's Park, the sun is shining, the Geordie journals are all for you. Right, this is, a, this is the one that's on. At user-vk3py9uh2n. Work on your username. But good question. Any updates on the summer tour, lads? Have we got anything? It might be a short one, this one. But have we got any updates so far? In terms of what Newcastle are doing pre-season? Newcastle United's pre-season plans. Yeah. Well... Australia end of season. There's talk of maybe going to Germany, I think, in a behind closed doors training, which we obviously won't get to. But then Japan seems to be Two gathering games in Japan, end a of lot July. of momentum for the Star end of Wars. July. Yeah, in Tokyo as well, or near uh, Yokohama, I think one of the one of the teams was as well. So yeah, that seems to be gathering momentum. Still not being confirmed. But I expect it will be soon. Yes, and yeah, that's going to be a 
slightly tougher one to get to. Just, just add to that as well. I do believe that Newcastle will spend a week in Europe somewhere before going to Japan. Yeah, to be so seen. Yeah, Germany. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, Japan. I think we spoke about it. logistically is not a great one to, to do, but obviously that's a different video in, its, in itself. But yeah, another. It'll be another PSR. Well, I say PSR. So it'll be commercial driven tour yeah. Japan like they did in the US last season uh, last summer sorry just purely because uh, they need as much money as possible to go towards spending money and obviously managing the PSR so, you, so yeah that, that, the information that I got very very early on actually maybe in February or March was that anything that the football club does this summer will be commercially driven and I think we're seeing the, the fruits of that labour that, that from a football perspective uh, I don't imagine Eddie Howe will be a very happy man um, he was less than impressed by the America stuff last year. The, there is a suggestion that the injuries and the problems that they've had, there is some some part blame on, on the travel and the, the climate and the disruption. I think in an ideal world, Eddie Howe would prefer Austria again. Yeah. Well, me and Jordan went a couple of years ago, all wrapped up. You weren't, you, you weren't on the beat then, were you? No, uh, no I was. I, I think. I was, I was good friend Miles Stoff yes, went I was, on, I was back, at, back at home doing my player ratings. Yeah. <laughs> Shame, but <laughs> you're here now. <laughs> We've all been there, Dom. We've all yeah. done it. We've all had to do the donkey work before the trips come. I've been there myself. But yeah, went to Austria and I'm pretty sure Eddie Howe would love to be just wrapped up in, in, in the Alps um, with no distractions, um, putting the players through their paces, but that's just not going to happen this summer. Um, and I don't think it's going to happen any summer. I think they're probably always going to always going to look to those commercial opportunities while the football club is trying to play catch up with everybody else for that 15 years when Newcastle became utterly forgetful. Oh, it's about to go. <laughs> it's about to go. Good job we've got the reactions of cats. Everyone was watching there, I think. Reactions of Nickpool. Yeah, it was. I was going to say something. I'm not starting not talking. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> So yeah, pre-season that's, pre that's where we think. And oh, another thing worth mentioning, Seller Cup. That could be coming back. Yeah, the back. Seller Cup will be coming back. I think they need to get better opponents. That's just my opinion. Oh, good. No, I think they oh, need better. you need better. top, top I level. think they need top because they didn't sell out here. And there's a reason why they didn't sell out, even if it was at the prices they were. It's because it wasn't enough of a draw. I think they need to, I think they need to up, the, up the levels. Look, we're not talking about the type of... Well, yeah, we are. They need to start doing things like what Arsenal, Tottenham and that have when they have their... So Audi Cup and all this kind of thing that they have, Newcastle United need to do something similar this summer. At least you get one big draw, in my what opinion. What team do you want to see Newcastle play? Yeah. I don't know because I don't know anybody's schedules, but I think I think you need, you want to see a top end Champions League club all coming right. here. Yeah. Not, none of the teams in Newcastle faced last Europa year. League, they're all yeah. Europa or Conference League. I think. <laughs> You're, you're, you're all watching this, and you keep seeing us jump because <laughs> we've also got a new tripod that. Uh, the tripod because we lost that everybody regular <laughs> watches we know that the uh, I lost the tripod in London yes so we've got a new tripod and it's not the steadiest we will get there with these technical things we will, we will. Off right now. it is right last two questions give the, the video a like if you're enjoying this at Sir Monkey Suit <laughs> Sir Monkey Suit <laughs> great name yeah great name I'm not sure if it has any, uh, I may have just fallen into a trap if it's got some kind of uh, negative connotations, but... No, I don't think so. No, we'll definitely have to Google that. Oh, maybe, maybe, not maybe, on a work, maybe not on a work laptop. <laughs> right, Dom, this one's for you. Is oh, it? Are you insane? Why? I was oh, was it? Because I said Newcastle... Are you insane? I doubted that Newcastle... Brighton and Man United five. tough to score goals against. Well, I mean, objectively they're not. But give the give the context for everyone out there who didn't see last week's video from Turf Moor. Well, I, I, I'm of the thinking that okay, Newcastle are scoring for fun at the moment. When have they in the Premier League anyway? <laughs> when have they historically scored goals at Old Trafford? Okay, they did it earlier in the season in the cup, but that seemed to be sort of exceptional circumstances almost. If they go to Manu and, and put two three past them, I'll, I'll be I'll be surprised. Although, it's having possible. watched them at Crystal Palace the other day, maybe not. Um, bearing in mind, I did speak, uh, obviously, before Man U played Crystal Palace uh, in our last video. So, yeah, I just, I'm being pessimistic. I just think, to act like it's a, it's a banker that Newcastle will score five goals in three games when two are away, which 
is as new Newcastle found out this season almost a flip of the coin whether Newcastle play well or play badly um, and Brighton at home definitely possible that they can put a few past them but like you say Brighton you just don't know what what team is going to turn up yeah, they got a good result the other day kept a clean sheet against Aston Villa was it Brighton yeah, yeah well, so you just never know I, I thought it was quite good that Brighton sort of ended that little run they're on it's very windy here. Apologies if the mic is picking that up. Top of the car park. We are it? top of the car park with St James's Park in the background here. Beautiful sunny day, but the, it's blustery out there. It's blustery out there if you're going to head out. This is like the Sky Sports spot, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's like the takeover. Just trying to be thing. clever, aren't we? Yeah. Trying to be clever and it's, it's backfired to an extent. So what we'll do is we'll jump onto the last question. Thanks to you guys for all of the questions that you have sent in. Uh, I'll fire this one to you first, Jordan, with Dom answering the last one. Can you read it? Wilson for no, <laughs> gone. terrible handwriting. I used to have lovely handwriting when I was at school, and then it just went all the <laughs> pot when I became a journalist. Question is from at Ali B One. Callum Wilson for the Euro squad thoughts kind of ties into the injury thing we talked about earlier. Is he fit? Is he not? Is a is it fully fit? Callum Wilson in with a shout at making the Euro squad this year. Uh, I think he's I think he's probably one injury away from getting in the Euro squad. I think if Callum Wilson had stayed fit all season like Ollie Watkins, I think it would probably be a toss-up between them two and maybe Ivan Tony. But if you look at Ivan Tony's current form, he's not exactly in form, is he? Um, I think it's a long barren run he's without a goal now. So if you're talking form between now and the end of the season, then and Callum Wilson is indeed fit and scores more goals, and why not? He's been in squads before. As you mentioned previously, Liam, Callum, uh, Gareth Southgate, sorry, has his, well we've all said that he's got his favourites. Callum Wilson has been in previous England squads. If Gareth Southgate trusts him enough, then Callum Wilson scoring goals, and I, I don't see why not. I think I think it's a, a possibility. So I think on, on English out of English strikers, I think Callum Wilson in the Premier League, whilst fit and not firing, is probably probably the best or one of the, the best. I think he's I think Aston Villa fans out of Jordy Journals would probably uh, disagree, but I, I do think Callum Wilson, when he's fully fit and firing, is probably better than Ollie Watkins. But I think Ollie Watkins will go on to be a better striker because of his current age and because of the level he's currently been. I think Callum Wilson's sort of towards the end of his career, if he's like in his 30s. But if you put them both against you now and Callum Wilson's fit, I think he's better. So I think, do you think there's, for me, it's it's not a, I don't think Watkins is the conversation because I think you'll take Watkins as he's two. I do agree with some of the sentiments there, Jordan. I think the, the conversation's Ivan Tony, and it, it's almost like a sliding doors moment. I think this season with a Wilson Tony one, I think it was either going to be one or the other. We won't take both. Um, and Wilson was injured when Tony came back, and came back with a little bit of a bang. Tony's got a slightly different. I mean, I, I think Ivan Tony, if fully fit, is potentially a better strike. I think Callum Wilson it as well. Um, however, there's that trust. And, yes. and is Tony producing it? Is he the right character? Does he have the right mentality, attitude? Is, does that all come into play for a Gareth Southgate? It absolutely does, because there's certain reasons why certain players just never got a real sniff in the team. Um, no, <laughs> I'll hold it. I was about to make an excellent point, actually. Uh, no, um, I'll you just go, go back to someone like... I know you won't agree with this, but... I thought John Joe Shelby back in the day had a good shout of being in the England squad and just would never get a pick because I don't think his personality quite yeah. quite matched up with what Gareth Southgate wanted. And I think Callum Wilson just ticks a lot of boxes. And as a tournament player, okay, injuries aside, he just, like he is a good tournament player as a sort of complementary to to Harry Kane, Ollie Watkins, he offers something different. If you want a player to come on with 20 minutes to go and try and get you a goal, then there's not many better English strikers around than Callum Wilson. As Newcastle found out this season, where Callum, I think he's only made nine Premier League starts, he scored nine, he's nine lethal, goals. He's lethal, So, and a lot of those, obviously, goals have, have come off the bench as well. So, I think if Newcastle, uh, sorry, if England are chasing something, then Callum Wilson has something to offer and we saw even in the World Cup when he comes on and the game's already won save Harry Kane's legs Callum Wilson can come on and do a bit of running uh, bully the defenders a little bit and I think he offers a lot and it's just that that massive caveat of 
is he fit and can he stay fit because tournament football it's such a microcosm of football where you're playing so many games in such a quick time training things like that rest can Callum Wilson manage that and because even in the last World Cup I think we touched upon he did miss quite a bit of training and he was in and out of uh, like being a substitute and things like that so one injury is the difference potentially between actually being on the bench and getting on or maybe having your entire tournament wiped out so that's another thing Gareth Southgate would have to consider same goes with every player but I think the sort of risk factor with Callum Wilson is slightly higher than most I would probably if I am Gareth Southgate I would probably take Ivan Tony and that doesn't mean I'm a big fan not a massive fan of Callum Wilson I just think he's just got I, I, there's something I really like about Tony I think he's raw in some of the aspects he plays he's brutality at times he's physical he's he's got good technique takes a fantastic penalty um, he's a good finisher himself can be lethal at his very best I'll probably take him I think Watkins offers you that bit something different I think I think the sliding doors moment would be difficult for Callum Wilson to displace any of those but like you say an injury here or there and the whole thing changes right you've got 40 minutes out of Geordie Journals it's just hope people can hear it I know we just hope you can hear it we've done my best we can't do much more than this <laughs> we can't can we I've noticed the mic we've half made a conscious effort to make sure the, the mic is on left and right yes on the screen though. it is so it's, it's on left and right if you're listening apologies if you only get it in your right or your left <laughs> and apologies if you hear the road behind me but it's, it seems to be picking it up quite a lot but okay. try the error try the error we'll get there we always will right it's been a pleasure thanks for all your questions do fire more in if you've got any questions you want the Geordie journalist to answer and we will keep you updated with any developments that we hear any videos any shorts um, and we might have a little surprise for you on Saturday's video might we we might have a little surprise for the viewers it's out there be a surprise for me as well I don't know. you do you just need to think there'll be a little surprise for everybody which benefits the Geordie Journal's channel and hopefully you guys out there too right it's been a pleasure like comment share subscribe for all of your Geordie Journal's content <laughs>